The truth is, with the busy lives we're all living today, becoming more self-sufficient seems to be out of reach for most of us, including ourselves. And it's totally fine to not aim for complete independence. But what if we could be at least partially self-sufficient in something? In this video, we're diving into a topic that is very close to our heart, ensuring that a family has enough food a year round. I'm going to break down a nine strategies that are doable for anyone with a busy lifestyle. And if you combine even a few of these strategies, they can create a reliable food source and increase the food security for your family. So let's jump right into the methods, starting with the ones that require the most effort, all the way down to those that require very little effort. And the first one on the list is, of course, a vegetable gardening. This is probably one of the most popular ways for people to get started on their fruit, food growing journey. And it's also one of the most laborsome tasks on the homestead that requires the most effort. Our goal with growing food in general is to make our gardens work for us and not the other way around. And I see so many people getting overwhelmed and burned out with growing their own food and homesteading simply because they're trying to take on too many things at once. And that's a shame because we do this to live a better lifestyle and not to give us an extra headache or a huge amount of extra work. So the approach that we take to gardening is all about efficiency. We choose low maintenance gardening methods and mostly focus on high yield crops that don't require a lot of work. To help with this, we use a method that's called no-dig gardening. Now, if you've been following along on our journey here on YouTube, uh, you've seen me make many videos about this. But if you haven't seen those videos, it's essentially a technique that not only saves your back because there's just very little weeding to do, but it also promotes a thriving ecosystem beneath the surface of the soil. And healthy soil means healthy plants, which translates into abundant harvests. Now, I want to be clear that you don't need a large piece of land or a large garden to get started. Even a small plot of land or some well-placed containers can yield a surprising amount of fresh produce. In fact, if you do have a small garden, a great way to increase the amount of food that you can grow in a small space is through interplanting or companion planting. This is about uh, strategically placing plants that could potentially benefit each other, like uh, planting basil near tomatoes to deter pests, or uh, plant plants that have different maturity times in the same space. This way you can harvest the faster growing veggies first and once you've harvested those, there will be extra space for those that require more time to mature. It's a simple yet effective way to increase the productivity of your garden. The goal here is to not overwhelm yourself, start small, learn what works in your specific environment and gradually expand. Start by growing what you like to eat and with each passing season, you will gain more confidence and skills and your garden can become a significant source of food for your family. Oh yes, and one last piece of advice, keep a journal. Document what you plant, when you plant it, and how it performs. This information is important for making adjustments and improvements in the next seasons. Next up is strategy number two, and that is preserving your own food. Preserving your food is a great way to extend the harvest and ensure that you have a reliable supply of food year round. Now I understand that if you've never preserved anything before, it might seem a little bit difficult, but with any skill on the homestead, it is really worth learning. There are many ways that you can use to preserve your harvest to make your food last longer. Um, some require quite a bit of equipment and effort whereas others are as simple as just hanging up the harvest to dry. For example this garlic here. This is a garlic that we harvested in early June uh, from a crop that we planted about a year ago. After we harvested them we just hung them up in a dry location out of the direct sunlight and this cures the garlic so that we can enjoy them for months to come. But you can also do this with uh, something like figs. We planted well over figs on uh, well over 10 uh, fig trees on our land, but they've been only in the ground for a year. So we don't get any harvest from them yet. But in the surrounding area here, we can find huge amount of fig trees and some of our friends have established trees. So it's a great food source for us in this area. Unfortunately, fresh figs don't last that long. But if you're able to remove the moisture, either through drying them in the sun or using a small dehydrator, you can store them for up to six to 12 months. We've done this with uh, figs, with apples and even eggplants. Now, 
I'm personally much more of a fan of fresh fruits, but it's worth considering drying some of them so that you can enjoy them throughout the year. That is, of course, if you don't have two little kids that eat them like candy on a daily basis. Then we've got these olives. Now olives can be eaten raw and directly from the tree, but they're extremely bitter. Let's pick one and see how it actually tastes. I don't exactly know what it is that is in the olive. It's a certain compound that makes them taste this way. And that's why most of the olives are either directly made into olive oil or soaked in a brine, which is essentially just a salted water. This will remove some, <laughs> this will remove some of the bitterness of the olives and makes them much nicer in my, my opinion. My wife made a couple of jars last year from a small harvest that we've got from these trees. And they're really great to eat just as is uh, in pizzas or in salads or pretty much any Mediterranean dish as long as, long as they've been cured for a little while. <laughs> oh, it's, it's like when you eat a fresh olive, it's like it, all the moisture gets sucked out of your, your mouth. Anyway, I took some good ones. Where were we? Uh, another great way to preserve fruits and vegetables is through canning. So although this is quite a lot of hard work, during the months of the year when it seems that you have the least amount of time. Uh, that's why I, I always recommend for the men out there who aren't settled yet, find yourself a beautiful wife who is passionate about this and uses this, uses this as part of the homeschooling curriculum for your children. All joking aside, my wife does all the canning and she pretty much cans everything she can get her hands on. I really, I even have to watch out for what I say right now or I might end up in a jar. Anyways, she made these beautiful jars of apple compote, but we also use this for green beans, tomato sauces, and pretty much anything that you can think of. Learning how to preserve your food is a skill well worth learning. There are countless of ways to preserve your harvest, uh, from drying to fermenting and even freezing. And from personal experience, all I can say is that don't be afraid to start small. Try some of the methods out, experiment a little bit and find what works, uh, find what works best for you and your family so that you can too enjoy the fruits and vegetables of your labor throughout the year. Now let's move on to strategy number three and that is growing your own herbs. Now you might be wondering why herbs are a crucial part for our self-sufficiency plan and well at least to us they're a must-have in any garden. They can be used for many things and personally we use a lot of them on a daily basis for most of the meals that we make. Many of them are also known to be medicinal and offer a range of health benefits from boosting immunity to helping with digestion or even helping you get better when you get a seasonal cold. They're also known to be really useful for natural pest control and to attract beneficial insects. The wild bees that, I don't know if you can see it here, but they sure seem to love them. One of the things I like most about growing herbs is that they're very low maintenance. They don't require a lot of attention, they don't need a lot of inputs, and they give back generously. Here I'm standing around our fire pit and we've planted a whole bunch of different herbs. We've got uh, some sage, thyme, chives, rosemary, and a whole mixture of different species. We started this garden just over a year ago now and other than creating some very basic raised garden beds and a bit of compost and mulch, they've grown really well, providing us with pretty much all the herbs that we need for our personal use. The great thing with herbs is that you can start it with a very small space. They're perfect to grow in pots or in containers and you can plant them nearly anywhere in the garden, which means that you don't need a lot of land to enjoy your own favorite herbs. Personally, we focus mainly on the herbs that we use most often. It's just so much nicer that when you're cooking or you want to make a refreshing drink, you just walk a couple of meters into your garden, grab whatever you need and just get going with your day. It saves you a lot of time and a lot of money having to go to the grocery store. Moving on to strategy number four, perennial vegetables. It's quite an overlooked part of gardening, but if you hate the fact of having to keep planting annual vegetables in succession, perennial vegetables might be a better solution for you. These vegetables, as you guessed it, are perennial plants that once established, come back year after year after year, providing you with a steady source of fresh homegrown food. Some well-known uh, examples of perennials are artich artichokes, uh, this asparagus, rhubarb, but there are a ton of other varieties uh, that you can try out. 
For now, on this land, we've only planted a handful of perennial vegetables with not too crazy much success yet, partly because we simply were too busy with too many other things, but we've just started several trays of artichokes, some rhubarb, some asparagus, and we plan on purchasing and planting a wide diversity of different types all over the land to see which perform best in this climate and soil type. They will take a little bit longer to establish, so don't expect to be harvesting too much in the first few years, but once they are established, they'll be very welcome addition to your family's food supply. Moving on to strategy number five, berries. Now what would our homestead be if we didn't grow our own candy? Berries are great plants for any garden, although not necessarily to become more self-sufficient, but I mean it's lovely to snack on some of the fruits while you're walking in the garden and if you have enough space on your homestead, they are definitely worth considering. They are relatively easy to grow. They can provide, uh, they can provide you with a large amount of sweet and nutritious little fruits. They're incredibly low maintenance, making them a perfect fit for any busy homesteader's lifestyle. It's difficult to have any favorites when it comes to berries, simply because they're all just so delicious. And fortunately for us, there are a lot of varieties to choose from. Here we've got a raspberry, just before we had a blackberry, there's goji berries, blueberries, I mean, the list goes on. Right now, we haven't planted nearly as much as we would like to have yet, but each year we continue to make progress and add some new plants in the mix. While they do take some time to establish, the payoff is well worth it. By selecting many different types of varieties, we can have a diverse supply of fresh homegrown berries that taste a million times better than the ones that you can get in the store. Now, I can go over all the individual fruit and nut trees, the herbs, the berries, perennial, and even annual vegetables. But what if we combine them all together and grow them in the same space? That's when you get a food forest. And that's strategy number six, and the strategy that I'm personally most passionate about. A food forest is essentially a large garden that mimics the natural ecosystem and can be a great strategy in your overall plan. It's a carefully designed garden where trees, shrubs, herbs, and other plants work together to create ultimate abundance. From fruit and nut trees to perennial vegetables and herbs, you're essentially creating a mini ecosystem that provides your family with a large diversity of your favorite food. But in reality, these systems go far beyond providing just food. And the great thing is, it doesn't matter how large or small your garden is, there are successful examples of people that have created them in pretty much any space and climate. From urban settings all the way down to large reforestation projects. And what I personally love most about this system that is that it requires very minimal maintenance once established. Nature will essentially do most of the work for you, which will allow you to spend less time with any upkeep and more time simply enjoying the harvest. Having said that, with any perennial based system, a food forest is a long term investment. It, uh, it takes some time and careful planning to establish, but once it's up and running, it becomes a self-sustaining ecosystem that can provide your family for generations to come. Definitely a good strategy for building a more self-reliant lifestyle. Moving on to strategy number seven, chickens. I've covered this in previous videos already, but chickens are very low maintenance animals that provide a wide variety of functions on the homestead. They are amazing layers of protein rich eggs. They forage, they help with pest control. Their droppings are very rich in nutrients and they can turn your kitchen scraps and garden waste into valuable compost. On our homestead, we have five different types of breeds, mostly Portuguese breeds, all with different purposes. Some are great for meat, some are great for laying eggs, and some are dual pur purpose birds, which essentially means that they're good for meat as well as for laying eggs. Now, the reason that we chose to initially use these five breeds is simply because we wanted to look at which ones performs the best within the context of our land. And honestly, for now, we've had them about six months now and they've been doing really well all of them so we'll see how we're going to continue and how this will evolve over time to get started with chickens it does require a little bit of an initial setup with a coop and a chicken run but once that's set up they're very low maintenance i think we spent maximum 10 minutes a day cleaning their water giving them some food and collecting the eggs so considering all of that they are perfect birds to get started with and are very helpful on the journey of becoming a little bit more self-sufficient which brings us to strategy number eight dogs you can eat dogs. <laughs> which brings us to strategy number eight 
foraging. This is a great way to supplement the diversity and quantity of food that you're growing at home. Foraging is basically gathering edible species from your local environment, like fruits, nuts, mushrooms, and even herbs. This is obviously one of the strategies that requires the least amount of effort from your side. You simply go to the locations at the right times of the year from where you know there are edible plants and you just collect a little bit of nature's abundance. While doing this, it's important to harvest responsibly and make sure that you don't eat anything that you can't identify. It's definitely worth taking the time to learn about the edible plants in your area so you can tap into a potentially abundant food source without much effort. One of our favorite foraging experiences is harvesting chestnuts from a local forest. Not too far from here, there's a mature forest that is completely loaded with chestnuts. So from now on, every year we'll go to that place and harvest a couple of kilos to supplement our diet. Next to harvesting the nuts, we're also going to germinate many of them so that we can start planting them everywhere on our own land. This way, as our own trees mature, we'll get a steady source of high quality nuts that go a long way in the kitchen. Another awesome nut that we just recently discovered is pine nuts. About a week ago, we just happened to stumble into a couple of large mature pine trees. The whole floor was littered with pine cones and it seemed that no one was, no one was harvesting them. So as any normal person would do, we asked the owners of the land for permission to harvest some of the pine nuts and they said we could take as many as we liked. My wife and our kids harvested about a jar full of nuts pretty much ate a third of it already and we're definitely going to germinate many of them so that we can grow uh, more on our property as well. We already planted several pine trees but they will take a long time before they start producing. I find it always so amazing that once you start looking around you in your area, you realize that there's just so much food growing everywhere. It's quite incredible. For us, this is really all about supplementing our existing food sources and not replacing them entirely. But honestly, it's mostly about having a good time with the kids, spending some time in nature and going on an adventure in search of food in the local forests. Anyway, harvest responsibly, take only a little bit and leave some for the local wildlife. Let's move on to the next strategy and that is to connect with local farmers. Let's face it, as much as we'd like to become more self-sufficient, in one way or another we are all dependent on the communities around us. And rather than trying to live in complete isolation, why not support the local farms to supply us with the food that we don't grow? I mean, we all need to stock up on groceries, so if we can find and support small farmers in our area, we can have mutually beneficial relationships within our communities. Farmers are arguably the most important assets to any society. Without them, well, we'll probably all end up eating laboratory-grown frankenfood. But if we can create relationships with local farmers, we can secure a large part of our daily diet in a cost-effective way. And the best way to go about this, coming from a former farmer, is to buy your fruits and veggies in high season. When there is an abundance of a specific crop, prices ultimately go down. Whenever there is a surplus, you can buy it in bulk and try to process and store as much as you feasibly can handle so that although you didn't grow it yourself, you can still enjoy these foods throughout the year without much effort on your side. So get to know your local farmers, buy in high season, preferably buy in bulk, preserve what you can and stock up your pantry. All the strategies that we covered are the nine ways we personally use to increase our self-reliance, become more self-sufficient and simply provide our family with awesome food. Of course, there are many more strategies out there that we haven't covered and you might not be able or interested in doing all of them. But even if you can combine just a few of these strategies together, they become a great approach to sustaining your family's food supply. I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you haven't subscribed to the channel or our weekly newsletter yet, consider doing that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Time to go to bed. <laughs>